History will always surprise us. That's what makes it endlessly fascinating. Much of history deals with conflicts and enemies, war and peace. But one category of these surprises is this, historic figures who became unexpected friends. Here are three such friendships. In the annals of American history, the friendship between Mark Twain, the celebrated author and humorist, and Ulysses S. Grant, the distinguished Civil War general and 18th president, stands as a remarkable fusion of literature and politics. Both men came from modest beginnings to become giants in their respective fields. Mark Twain, born Samuel Clemens, was once a riverboat pilot on the Mississippi River. In fact, Mark Twain is a term used in navigation to indicate a water depth of two fathoms, or twelve feet, which signifies safe passage for the steamboat. The phrase Mark Twain was often called out by leadsmen on a riverboat to indicate that the water was deep enough for safe navigation. Good to go, in essence. That time of Twain's life impacted so greatly, he chose that term as his pen name. Grant's career also had some ups and downs. He started out in the military during the Mexican-American War, but retired to civilian life. In the 1850s, he worked various jobs, including at one point selling firewood. This endeavor involved him hauling and selling cut firewood on the streets of St. Louis to earn a modest income. His customers probably would not have pegged him as a future president. Things changed in 1860. With the advent of war, Grant re-enlisted in the military and began his rise up step by step, success by success, to become Lincoln's most reliable general. Twain became a supporter of Grant's during the Civil War, as he followed Grant's strategy from a distance as a reporter for a Nevada-based newspaper. Their paths converged in the post-war era, a period marked by reconstruction, political upheaval, and the need for healing in a nation scarred by conflict. Twain's burgeoning career as a writer and Grant's ascension to the presidency after military victory brought the two men closer together. They met in July of 1870. Twain made a favorable impression on Grant, and their relationship developed from that point on. Twain, a keen observer of human nature and societal dynamics, recognized in Grant a leader who possessed both strength and a genuine commitment to the welfare of the nation. As a journalist, Twain became a vocal supporter of Grant's presidency. In a series of scathing articles, he targeted individuals such as Horace Greeley, who was Grant's opponent in the 1872 presidential election. Twain's ability to wield satire and humor to lampoon political figures had impact in shaping public perception and influencing the political discourse. Twain had a way with words. Twain's support for Grant was constant throughout his political career. But the heart of the Twain-Grant collaboration came in the aftermath of Grant's presidency. Grant had never been a good businessman or particularly skilled with his finances. Perhaps that is why he was selling firewood years earlier. In 1884, Grant faced financial ruin due to his unwise involvement with a Wall Street firm that had conned him into attaching his name to essentially a Ponzi scheme. While he avoided criminal charges, he was financially ruined. Shortly after that, he was diagnosed with throat cancer, perhaps from a life of cigar smoking. Facing his mortality, Grant was horrified that he would leave his wife in the poorhouse. He had one last card to play. His personal account of the Civil War was all he had to offer at this point. Mark Twain, recognizing the historical significance of Grant's first-hand account of the Civil War, extended a lifeline to the former president. He requested Grant write his memoirs of the Civil War and grant Twain the rights to publish that tome. He offered Grant an unprecedented deal through his publishing company, Charles L. Webster and AMPO Company, offering an unheard of 70% of the profit. Grant signed with Twain and went to work. Grant spent most of the following year creating those memoirs. Twain visited and encouraged Grant throughout that time, as Grant's cancer made the work progressively more difficult. But complete them he did, in spite of great pain at many moments. The memoirs titled Personal Memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant were completed shortly before Grant's death on July 23, 1885. 
The work covered Grant's military career, including his experiences during the Mexican-American War, the American Civil War, as well as his tenure as the 18th President of the United States. There was much recent history for an eager public to read and understand. Twain released the memoirs in serialized form in magazines before being published as a two-volume set in 1885. Grant's memoirs achieved remarkable success, providing much-needed financial stability for his family after his passing, thanks in large part to Grant's friend, Mark Twain. Twain's own life took him through financial challenges and emotional ups and downs, including the death of his wife, Olivia, in 1904. He continued to write, leaving behind a body of work that included classics such as The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn and A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. In the first volume of Twain's autobiography, he reflected on Grant's virtues and his admiration for the former president. Twain praised Grant's honesty, integrity, and straightforwardness, emphasizing Grant's qualities as a military leader, president, and as a genuine person. Both Ulysses S. Grant and Samuel Clemens, a.k.a. Mark Twain, rose from humble origins to greatness, one a writer, the other a victorious general and pivotal American president. Fate made them friends. Russia and Mexico are far, far apart. Leon Trotsky, the Russian revolutionary and political theorist, and Frida Kahlo, the renowned Mexican artist, formed a captivating and unusual friendship that unfolded against the backdrop of political turmoil and personal struggles. Born thousands of miles apart in two very different cultures, they came together under dire circumstances and became close at a time both needed support. The roots of Trotsky and Kahlo's friendship can be traced back to the tumultuous years of the early 1930s. Trotsky, once a prominent figure in the Bolshevik Revolution alongside Vladimir Lenin, had fallen out of favor with Joseph Stalin and had been expelled from the Soviet Union in 1929. After a series of exiles, he found himself seeking refuge in Mexico in 1937, a country that would become both a sanctuary and a stage for the unfolding drama of his life. Frida Kahlo, a painter known for her surreal and emotionally charged self-portraits, was no stranger to political upheaval and personal adversity. Her life had been marked by physical pain, stemming from a severe bus accident in her youth, as well as emotional struggles, including a tumultuous relationship with fellow artist Diego Rivera. Despite their marital turbulence, Rivera and Kahlo were actively involved in leftist political circles, aligning themselves with the Mexican Communist Party. The paths of Trotsky and Kahlo crossed when Rivera, who was sympathetic to Trotsky's plight, offered him asylum in Mexico. The revolutionary and his wife, Natalia Sedova, moved into the Blue House, where Kahlo and Rivera lived. Kahlo was an artist deeply connected to her Mexican heritage, drawing inspiration from indigenous culture and folklore. Trotsky, the intellectual and devoted communist, was focused on political issues and power. One used the brush, the other the pen and the rifle. They shared a number of left-wing ideals and perhaps more. The Blue House became a hub of intellectual and artistic exchange. Trotsky, despite being under constant threat from Stalinist agents, engaged in discussions with Kahlo and Rivera on politics, art, and the direction of the Mexican left. The bond between Trotsky and Kahlo extended beyond the realm of intellectual discourse. They developed a genuine affection for each other. It is believed by many historians that they became romantically involved. The artist's own depictions of Trotsky in her paintings provide a fascinating window into their relationship. Kahlo created several portraits of Trotsky during his time in Mexico, capturing not only his likeness, but also infusing the canvases with a mix of admiration, curiosity, and, some argue, a hint of sensuality. Back in Moscow in 1936, Trotsky was tried in absentia in one of the show trials created by Stalin and his underlings. He was sentenced to death after being convicted in the predetermined proceeding. Stalin was not through with Trotsky, even at this great distance. Somehow, 
he still felt Trotsky a threat. On August 20th, 1940, in Mexico City, a Stalinist agent, Ramon Mercader, put an ice pick into Trotsky's skull. It is assumed this was under orders from Josef Stalin. Leon Trotsky succumbed to his injuries the next day. Stalin did not forgive nor forget. The relationship between Trotsky and Kahlo seems to have veered between camaraderie and romantic passion that was rooted in their political beliefs. Trotsky's death marked the conclusion of a chapter in Kahlo's life, but their friendship continued to resonate in her art. The poignant painting, The Wounded Table, features a central image of a bloody table surrounded by figures representing Kahlo, Trotsky, and other revolutionaries. The work stands as a powerful testament to the enduring impact of the connection between the Russian communist, the freewheeling Mexican bohemian artistic genius, and by proxy, the Soviet dictator, Josef Stalin. In the vibrant tapestry of the 20th century's artistic and comedic landscape, few friendships stand out as boldly and unexpectedly as that between Harpo Marx, the silent, curly-haired member of the Marx Brothers, and Salvador Dali, the eccentric and surrealistic Spanish painter. Their friendship, born out of chance and sustained by a shared appreciation for the absurd, unfolded against the backdrop of Hollywood's golden age and the avant-garde art scene. The story of Harpo Marx and Salvador Dali begins with a chance encounter in the late 1930s. Dali, already a celebrated figure in the art world for his surrealistic masterpieces, was intrigued by the Marx Brothers and their unique and sly brand of comedy. In 1937, he attended a party in Hollywood where he had the opportunity to meet Harpo in person. Dali, known for his flamboyant personality and eccentricity, was immediately drawn to Harpo's silent and expressive comedic style. In Harpo, he found a kindred spirit who, through physical comedy, could convey the absurdity and surrealism that Dali often depicted on canvas. They clicked. Their meeting marked the beginning of an unlikely friendship that would transcend the boundaries of their respective artistic domains. The Marx Brothers at that time were a force to be reckoned with in the world of entertainment at the height of their popularity. Harpo, in particular, distinguished himself through his silent antics, expressive gestures, and the iconic honking of his horn. The Marx Brothers films, such as Duck Soup and A Night at the Opera, showcased a unique blend of slapstick, wordplay, and social satire. In Dali, Harpo found a kindred spirit who reveled in the absurd and the fantastical. Dali's paintings, including The Persistence of Memory with its iconic melting clocks, embodied a dreamlike quality that resonated with Harpo's whimsical approach to comedy. The connection between the Marx Brothers' brand of absurdity and Dali's surrealism was not lost on the two men, and their friendship blossomed through a shared appreciation for pushing the boundaries of convention. As the friendship between Harpo Marx and Salvador Dali deepened, the two would often find themselves at Hollywood parties and social gatherings. Their presence together was a spectacle, with Dali's flamboyant mustache and Harpo's unmistakable curly hair making them a visually striking duo. At one memorable Hollywood gathering, Dali decided to paint a full-scale harp in Harpo's living room, transforming the space into an impromptu canvas. Word traveled about this, and the incident became a legendary tale, illustrating the unpredictable and joyous nature of their friendship, spontaneity and synergy. Their interactions extended beyond social gatherings and casual encounters. In 1936, Dali published a book titled Giraffes on Horseback Salad, which was conceived as a potential screenplay for a film. The story featured Harpo Marx as the protagonist and was filled with Dali's characteristic surreal imagery. Unfortunately, the film was never produced, but the project highlighted the collaborative and creative dimension of their friendship. Imagine what might have been. Harpo Marx and Salvador Dali maintained their friendship until Harpo's death in 1964. Despite the differences in their artistic mediums and backgrounds, the two men shared a bond rooted in the celebration of the absurd and the rejection of artistic and societal norms. 
Harpo's son, Bill Marks, has recounted anecdotes about his father's friendship with Dali, underscoring the genuine camaraderie that existed between the two creative geniuses. The legacy of that relationship endures not only in the annals of Hollywood and art history, but in the larger culture as well. Pop art icon Andy Warhol was a fan of both the Marx Brothers and Salvador Dali. Indeed, he collaborated with Dali in the 1960s S. Later, musician Frank Zappa expressed admiration for both the Marx Brothers and Salvador Dali as well. In the convergence of slapstick comedy and surrealistic art, Harpo Marx and Salvador Dali created a friendship that transcended the limits of convention that celebrated each man's amazing talents. We're glad they did. This ends our episode on surprising historic pals. Friendship can arise in unusual places, even between unusual historic figures. Perhaps greatness is drawn to greatness, or perhaps greatness creates its own loneliness. Thanks for watching. History never ends.